Hi, this is Kathleen from British GQ. We're here in London with Sean Mendes, the incredibly popular 19-year-old Canadian pop star. Tell us about the third album. One thing that I really realized with this album was I, I started paying attention to not only like what I wanted to make with music, but like what I was listening to. Mm. And I and I and I found that, you know, like in the gym in the morning I would listen to Kanye West and like the drive home I'd be listening to John Mayer and later that night I'd listening to like top forty hits or whatever. Um, realizing that like when it comes to genres that those walls are kind of broken down now. Um, and I even asked like I have a fourteen year old sister and I mm. ask her like, hey well, what's your favorite song? She'll say whether it's like Migos, like something like a rap song, and then she'll also in the same sentence say a Sam Smith song. And uh, it was like really kind of a, a big epiphany for me to realize that like nobody nowadays goes, I just like pop or I just like rap music, you know? So with that being said, I took that to heart and I really just let myself create music that I thought was good and I didn't think about genre. So when it comes to songs like In My Blood, which is more rock mm. influenced, and then you go to Lost in Japan, which is on the other side of the map in like an R&B sense, um, I really just, my, my thing was to make good music and to not worry about the style. And, and that's kind of how the whole album feels. And you've spoken before about wanting to make like anthems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I was playing uh, in England actually and Kings of Leon was headlining a festival and uh, I was able to go on stage behind them there's actually this hilarious video that if you if you guys find it's like me on stage like air guitaring behind Kings of Leon, and I was they played uh, Sex on Fire and used somebody and I was just just completely blown away by the like this anthemic electric guitar mm -hmm. big drums the way the crowd reacted um, that that night put me on a high for like two months <laughs> and I and I ran straight back to the studio basically plugged in the electric guitar and was like let's make a rock anthem mm -hmm. and that's how In Mad Blood was created. Would you say this album is reflective of kind of growing up? There's a song called Youth featuring Khalid. Yeah. And um, I was in uh, Europe touring when the Manchester attack happened mm. at the show. And I was actually in London in this hotel when the bridge attack happened. And, I, and around that whole time, and even to this day, um, so many of these crazy things are happening. I woke up one morning really overwhelmed. I remember texting Khalid, because we're good friends, being like, hey man, when we get together to write, we have to write something about like a statement of our generation, something more than 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 something that happens every day. Um, and uh, when I got together with him in LA, I, there was this thought of the word youth. And when I say mm. youth, I'm talking about how there's like a youthful feeling, like when you're a kid and you walk outside and you see the world as this awesome place. Mm. And how every time one of these terror attacks happens, it pulls that childish youth from us a little bit every more and more every time. And so we got together and we wrote a song about how that youth is ours to have and, and we won't let you know people take that away from us and so yeah like it's it's about stuff like that and then you go to the opposite side of the spectrum and it's about uh you know me waking up and the girl left me we're also in like an extremely extremely important time in in like mankind i don't think mm. like our gen we really truly realize how much of a of a change we're going through mm. right now um like I was saying about genre walls, like these these walls are not only to do with music, with with so many things. Like the acceptance level and the open-minded level is kind of just opening up in the most mm. incredible way. So um, I think now more than ever is like the most exciting time to be making music that has a real message behind it. Yeah, I guess even with like the current kind of marches and societal movements, we've been seeing so many more like young people being galvanized. I have a fourteen-year-old sister, and she you know, listening to her talk is just like so inspiring because she's so mature and she understands mm. so much and I, uh, it's, it's just really impressive and I think, I think kids nowadays are smarter than ever and mm. they, they are making such a big change and it's important to, you know, recognize that. So do you think young people are being listened to now more than kind of ever before? 100% and they always should have been listened to. Yeah. I think young people are the, the generation that is that is going to be the generation that you know rules the world, mm. you know, in the next generation. And I think you know the fact that we are making such a difference to listen to their stories and to hear what what how they feel. I'm I'm saying young people like I'm not young myself, yeah. you know, <laughs> but um, is so important. Like that that is what's really going to make the difference. That's never happened before. Mm. So yeah. And do you see that in your fan base? Like, do you think that they're empowered? Totally. And and the thing is, is like they're so smart. Like I think people don't understand like with social media and phones nowadays, 
self-education is, is on a crazy high level. Mm. You know, like kids nowadays know more than they're being taught in school. They know so much more because mm. it's just self-education. My sister's reading articles and stuff like that I never would have thought of reading when yeah. I was 14. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really so impressive. I think uh, we're going through a major, major shift in society and it's, and it's really awesome. And obviously, Sean's uh, very well known for being a kind of um, teen heartthrob, you know, massive pop star on, in that respect with lots of very, very dedicated young fans. Sure. Um, would you say that's like something that you're comfortable with or is that a kind of aspect of uh, growing up and your career so far that you're trying to move away from a little bit now? One thing that I notice is that I think maybe the media and people portray fans as this crazy mm. kind of hysterical, you know, group of people who like, you know, chase, chase everyone around. And when the truth is, is that if you walked outside with me and there's a few fans outside and we just and you saw the way they acted, it's like, I'd walk in and be like, hey, Sean, how's it going? Mm. Like like friends, you know? And there's this real, like, respect that we have for each other and mm. this love um, because we've grown up together that it's it's not that. It's much different than mm. that. And, and it's in a, in a great way. And you connect with your fans quite a lot using social media, right? Because I know you <clears throat> started out, um, Sean started making videos on Vines and your career has kind of been built around social media as with so many young superstars yeah, of today. Yeah, I started on Vine and, you know, use that platform to expand to Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. YouTube, and all those things. Um, but the goal was to make music, and, mm -hmm. and I started writing music, and um, I will say, like, without those platforms, I would have no career here today. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't something that I was trying to do. It was something that's in my generation. Our generation is to be connected through our phones, and it's just something that's very natural to me, and I think most people around my age. Um, and so it came natural. I was lucky with timing, and mm. the stars kind of aligned for me, you know? And I guess with social, that's where you see your fan base so clearly, like um, mm -hmm. the sheer volume of it, yeah. as it were. Does, does the, that look well, overwhelming? Or? The, thing, the truth is, is that you, you don't understand what, how many a thousand people is. I say a thousand people, and that's a, you know, that's a big number. It's a lot of people. Mm. But you don't really get how many people a thousand people is. And it's not until you're standing in front of an arena of 15,000, <laughs> or even more, you're standing in front of a festival in Brazil, mm. across the world from where you were born, in front of a hundred thousand people yeah. to really truly understand the actual the what what is happening online and it's it's those I remember a story I don't really talk about often was when I was 15 um, I went to there was like this meetup of Viners in Toronto and my parents were like yeah do you want us to come like what's it gonna be and I said to them I'm, I think I had 300,000 followers I said I don't know if anyone's gonna recognize me I'm not really sure what's going on I remember walking up like the su the subway stairs into the the middle of the city to see a group of like fifteen hundred people all turn oh and God. just chase me <laughs> to the restaurant. And I remember that in that moment, kind kind of like understanding, okay, these numbers are not a joke. These are physical people behind the screen. So it's it's really interesting. It's a crazy thing. What do you think now are like the most important qualities for like a, a kind of successful modern man? The biggest quality, and, and for men and for and for everyone, I think, mm. is is the thing of knowing that you don't know everything, mm. that you are not sure how to act, and 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 being open-minded. I think it's especially nowadays, and especially maybe in the older generation, it's so much easier for people to close their mind off. Um, and so, I guess in a man, I would say um, the greatest thing you could do is to be open-minded and, mm. and just kind of and let things come instead of deciding that you know what's good and what's not. And you've spoken before about, uh, you know, you willingly kind of admitted to feeling vulnerable <laughs> or nervous. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's important for, for young men to kind of express a vulnerability? Totally. And I think the truth is, is like, you know, especially when it comes to a song about In My Blood, which is me literally saying, laying on the bathroom floor, feeling nothing. Mm -hmm. And the, when I released that, I was scared. I was terrified. I was like, am I really about to release this to the world and like have people think that I'm weak? And I realized that the true weakness is to not talk about something like that mm. and, and it actually is true strength to talk about those feelings and being vulnerable and I think as much as guys say they don't feel that way they're just a lot of them are lying and and the truth is is that 90 percent of people feel that way mm. or a certain type of that way um, and it is hard to talk about so for me to be able to release that out and maybe hopefully push people to talk about it in their own lives more is really important.
So you strike me as also the kind of guy who would like hold doors open for women, that kind of do thing. Do I could? Yeah. Do you? So I must strike you as a good person. Yeah. Well, you just seem like you would be quite like chivalrous. And yeah. Do you believe in that kind of traditional I think, chiv chivalry? Yeah, absolutely. I think op open a door for a lady who wants the door to be open yeah. for her. <laughs> And if she answer. doesn't want the door to be open for her, don't. It's, a, it's really very diplomatic. Yeah, but it's yeah. true though. I mean, I've met people who want that and people and people who don't. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's really just about, you know, not not deciding what is what is right and wrong. Like I said, it's about evaluating the person and what mm. what do what are their needs. You know. And but what, yes, my yeah. go-to would be to open the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk us through your tattoos? I can see three, four here. How many mm. do you have in total? I have five. I have one on the back of my arm. Um, yeah, sure. So this is an elephant that I, I got with my mom. I, I, I wanted to get a tattoo with her and I, and I convinced her and the only thing she would get is an elephant on her finger. So we got I, this. It has in the same place? Same place. Yeah. Same tattoo. She's actually here. I don't know where she actually just went to her hometown, mm -hmm. but I wish she was here to show you. Anyways, this eight was um, a very fast decision, <laughs> influences involved, but basically there's a meaning behind it. Um, I was born uh, 1998, August 8th, which is a three, uh, eight's a very lucky number, so blah, 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 eight is a lucky number, I have it there. So anyways, can't get rid of it, it's a tattoo. Think before you get tattoos. Uh, <laughs> this swallow is um, basically a reminder of the fact that home isn't a building, but it's the people you love and the people uh, you know as family and friends. Um, because swallow is, is a sign of travelers, uh, people like, um, what are they, pilot, pilots. Who used to? Sailors. Sailors, yes. You know the story. That yeah. Sailors used to get a swallow tattoo yeah. before they would voyage across the world and get another one that came home. So I thought, you know, there's been days when I've been in hotel rooms being like, where is my home? Like, you know, like thinking too much about life. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that home is about people. It's not about a building. So yeah. This one is my first tattoo, um, which I thought about a lot. I should think about all my tattoos as much as this one because I won't ever regret this. Uh, the CN Tower, Toronto, which is my home, which is where my, my people are. Um, this is a voice note, actually, I recorded on my phone of my parents and my sister saying, I love you. Um, and then it's trees reflecting on water, all encaptured by a guitar. So yeah. Then on my back of my arm, which you, I'm sure you can find a photo of, is a, a light bulb. And the light bulb has roots coming out of the bottom of it. And my second album is Illuminate. And inside is, is uh, the, uh, a flower, an orchid, which is my mom's favorite flower telling me to stay grounded from my first real success to everything in the future, keep the roots grounded. How would you plan like a, the perfect first date? What would that entail for you? I think the perfect first date has nothing to do with the location or what you're eating or really kind of where you are. Mm. If I could find myself engaged in a conversation where I forget that I'm on the perfect first date, that would be the perfect first date. What do you think of dating apps? Would you ever use them? Yeah, I would love to use them. I unfortunately can't because people just think it's fake. No, that is. There's a celebrity dating app. Oh, I know about mm. it. It's, what is yeah. it it's called Raya. Yes. Raya. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I know about that. Would you do that? One for you? I think I would, I, I would do it just for fun, just mm. to see what's going on. But um, I do know like on Tinder and like Bumble and those apps, there's just tons of accounts of people pretending to be me. Really? And so <laughs> it's, not, it's just pointless for me to sign up. Everyone will think you're just a catfish. Exactly. So. Would you ever date a fan? Yeah, totally. I, there's, there's stories, you know, from peop, artists that I've met mm. telling me how I was playing in Rio and I looked into the crowd met and I met eyes with this girl and I just completely fell in love with her and how they're now, you know, the love of my life. Married. The kids. truth is, your wife or your girlfriend should be your biggest fan. And so at the end of the day, um, you should be each other's biggest fan. So yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that. You've mentioned before in an interview <laughs> that you've never like truly been in love. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Is it's still the yeah. case, um, which is which makes me a phony because I seem to write about love a lot. Um, but I think, you know, the, the reason I the reason I write about it is because I think there's two emotions that are two strong strongest of the humans' emotions, and it's hate and love. And hate is kind of that just sucks to write about hate. Yeah. <laughs> and no one wants to hear about that. So love has all these like it's like if you see love there's all these different webs of what you can say about mm. it and uh i have a really awesome imagination but i think <laughs> I've, I've been close to it but i don't mm. think i've truly ever felt love and i've never felt heartbreak so for me i'm just waiting to feel heartbreak so i can write a really awesome album we'll have loads of like yeah adele style songs. exactly I was yeah. i'm chasing adele 21.
you've done all this stuff with Armani as well. You um, did the smartwatch stuff, you yeah. closed the show. I walked the runway for Armani and um, it's very cool. I got to meet Mr. Armani and I was putting on clothes and he was like, Moving all of these like crazy things all over me, and he's like, <laughs> all the pins and he and goes, stuff. just he goes, just just unbutton the shirt. <laughs> I was like, oh god, okay. and then and then I, I got, I was like, cool, so I'm just gonna walk down the runway, right? No big deal, like just walk. And they're like, no, we want you to dance. And I'm like, dance, dance down the runway, <laughs> guys. I, I I play guitar. I don't know how to dance. <laughs> what so you I, do with your arms? So so I tried to do this like weird hop skip. Did you? Like, <laughs> if you watch, oh, it was. But I've it, actually only seen still. Oh my god! So the, the truth is, is that it's so much fun. It I I was so nervous, and uh, I got on the runway and I looked and everybody was smiling and everyone was just so excited and I was like, oh, this is kind of what it feels like to be performing on stage. And so I, for every model and everybody who walks the runway, I get it and it's really fun. So I guess obviously beyond like fashion stuff, I, you collect guitars, right? You have. 20 guitars? I probably have right? more than 20 guitars. I don't know how many guitars I have, but um, I, I've, I, I've uh, been given a bunch of guitars too by like like really amazing people and uh, yeah, they're collecting really fast. I'm 19. Which I is your this. favorite? That's impossible to ask. You just asked me like which one of my children are my favorite. Okay. Um, but if I had to answer... A significant one that you've been a gifted? A significant one. Yeah. Uh, m one of my first electric guitars was actually from John Mayer. Wow. Um, I first kind of met him and, and I told him, I was, hey man, I'm looking into getting electric guitars. What do you recommend? And he's like, oh, what hotel are you staying at? I, was like, I told him where I was. And he goes, um, when you get back, there's something waiting for you. And I got back to my hotel and there was a signed John Ooh. Mayer a custom guitar. Um, so that'll forever be a very important Special guitar to one. me. Um, and then I have a custom shop, Telecaster, from Chicago Music Exchange, which is basically what I wrote Treat You Better and, and all, all of my music on, and I play live every time, so yeah. When you were younger, you studied acting, right? Yeah. So was acting something that you always wanted to go into as well as music or instead of? Um, I actually wanted to be an actor for much longer than I wanted to be a singer when I was a kid. When mm. I was 11, I, I went and I auditioned for Prince Charming, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was insanely hard, insanely difficult. and. Um, I, I think people underestimate how difficult acting is. Um, but I remember I got on stage with that thing and my first scene, I walked out on a live show in front of all the parents and stuff and I had these glasses on and I put them on and both of the lenses fell out of oh. the holes. Yeah, and I was <laughs> like sad. terrified um, until, you know, now. And I think um, acting is, will, will come easy to me once I accept the fact that I, there's no reason to be nervous in mm -hmm. it. But, um, I plan on doing a lot of acting in the future. Right now, I just am obsessed with music, and I would rather just focus on that. So yeah. Do you think it maybe later down the line, it'd be like Harry Styles, yeah, absolutely, kind of move over into doing yeah, a big blockbuster, totally, and yeah. and acting, and and I want to produce and, and maybe write films eventually one day. Oh, cool. So that'd be awesome. Yeah, my my biggest goal would to be to you know produce and work on a movie concept and then also write the soundtrack to it like i don't know if you've seen into the wild eddie vetter writes this gorgeous like acoustic soundtrack yes i have yeah. with the guy that kind of yeah yeah, yeah. Actually, so the I soundtrack the ending there, so yeah. That, but yeah don't say the ending yeah. the soundtrack is all done by eddie vetter <laughs> yeah and it's and so those are some of his like most famous songs as as a solo act mm. um so yeah i would love to do that nice and you you went to the oscars right I didn't go to the Oscars. Oh, right. I went to um, like there was a, they have a there's like a party the day before uh, okay. for all the sponsors of the Oscars, nice. and I performed there. How was um, that? Oh, it was n the most nervous I've ever been in my whole life. It was absolutely tough crowd. Terrible. Not a, they were actually an incredible crowd. I'm yeah. sure I was after a few drinks, but they were <laughs> in really awesome, just like fun crowd. And I was very nervous because I'm used to playing in front of eight, 17 year old mm. girls and guys, and <laughs> um, not you know whatever that crowd was they were but afterwards um i got to see them the next day and uh they were all just so sweet it was, it was really nice so ever since that uh i can probably play in front of adults and i'll be okay yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that khalid is one of the collaborators on the new album yeah you've obviously collaborated with other big artists in the past so that's camilla cabello or you've spoken a lot about um kind of getting to know your idols people like ed sheeran in like a professional capacity mm -hmm. totally. um who would be your dream five dinner party guests if you could choose i think you know i this is the craziest so the i've had the most incredible year because i've actually got to work with all the people i've dreamed of working with okay. my whole life so i worked with john mayer on and he produced a song and he sold on a song on the album ed sheeran uh, another song i worked with on the album of ryan tedder one republic um 
you know, at a table that I think would be amazing would be uh, Alicia Keys because I, I, I did a, a guest mentoring on The Voice America with her and she is just incredible. I, I don't know if people really know how funny and witty she <laughs> is, but she's absolutely hilarious um, and just a dream person to be with. Alicia Keys, I would I would ask to be there. John Mayer, also insanely funny. One Republic's Ryan Tedder yeah. is, I'm just saying everyone's funny at this point, yeah. <laughs> but truly, so I, I don't think I've actually party. never laughed so hard in my life in like a writing session than with Ryan Tedder. Um, and then, I don't know, there's so many people I'd want at a dinner, but if I, if I could, if I, I would have Khalid at the table because mm. he's a good friend of mine. And then, I don't know, Julia. Oh. Julia's also mm. a sweetheart. So all musicians. Yes, I just named a bunch of musicians, which is kind of suck. I'm, I guess I know a lot of musicians, yeah. but there's much more people that would be amazing to have there. Actually, you know what? If I had to remove somebody, not going to say anyone I'd remove, yeah. <laughs> I was so lucky to meet Woody Harrelson and Matthew Ooh, McConaughey, fun. who are just like the, the coolest two guys and funniest guys I've ever seen. So um, I, would, I would have them at dinner too. Were they at the Oscars? Is that the they were at Oscar after party. Connect. Yeah, mm. and I saw them dancing, and it was just my dream came true. You know, Matthew McConaughey, I'm like obsessed with True Detective and, and actually seeing him in person was like completely Crazy. like seeing a ghost, yeah. I think that was like the real first time I was like Star Trek, mm -hmm. Star Trek. And him and Adam Sandler <laughs> are the two people I've really been, yeah, I know, yeah. weird. Go Thank on. you. No problem. Thanks, Sean.